Hello, and welcome to the Irish East Fleet. Today I want to talk to you about one of my favourite ruins in Ireland, Mount Shannon in County Limerick. This is how Mount Shannon now looks, and in the foreground you can see a few of its present occupants. The house originally stood at the centre of a 900-acre domain, famous for its trees and gardens. In a book on the history and topography of Limerick, published in the mid-1820s, the authors wrote of Mount Shannon that the plantations are laid out with fine taste and the gardens are extensive and well arranged. Aside from a handful of specimen trees, no evidence of the domain's former glories now remain. But here's how Mount Shannon used to look at the start of the last century. The core of the house was built around 1750 by the euphoniously named Silver Oliver, whose family's main estate was elsewhere in the county. Eventually, in the 19th century, the Olivers would come to build themselves a new residence there, which still stands and which is now called Castle Oliver. Silver Oliver doesn't seem to have remained at Mount Shannon for very long, because by the 1760s, the property had passed into the ownership of another man called John Fitzgibbon. He'd been born a Roman Catholic, but he converted to the established church because he wanted to practice as a lawyer, and under existing penal legislation, all non-conformists were banned from that profession. In the event, John Fitzgibbon was extremely successful and left a large fortune when he died in 1780 to his son, also called John, but better known today as Black Jack Fitzgibbon. Many stories are told of Black Jack, some of them apocryphal, few if any of them kind. After studying at Trinity College Dublin and Christchurch Oxford, he became a lawyer as his father had before him. He was first elected to the Irish House of Commons in 1778 and five years later appointed Irish Attorney General. In 1789, he was made Lord Chancellor for Ireland, the last man to hold that office since it was abolished with his support and in return for a very lucrative pension in 1800. Around the time he became Lord Chancellor, he was painted in his official robes by Gilbert Stuart. He also received his first title as Baron Fitzgibbon. He was subsequently made a Viscount and finally became Earl of Clare in 1795. Although unquestionably brilliant and hardworking, Fitzgibbon was also highly bigoted. He was a hardline member of the Protestant ascendancy, promoting whatever measures he believed were best to preserve that group's political power in Ireland. He supported harsh measures against participants in the 1798 rebellion and was virulently hostile to Roman Catholics, even though his father had originally been a member of that faith. When it came to the Act of Union in 1800, of which he was an ardent supporter, there had been widespread understanding beforehand that the legislation would be accompanied by concessions to Catholics so that they could enjoy greater civil liberties. However, Black Jack persuaded George III that any such liberalization of the status quo would be a violation of the king's coronation oath, and he thus ensured pro-emancipation measures were not included in the eventual Act of Union. It's said that Black Jack once declared that he would make his fellow Irishmen as tame as a dead cat. As a result, there are many stories of how when he went out in his coach, dead cats were thrown at it. And even when he died, supposedly dead cats were flung into his grave. He was buried in January 1802, having suffered a fall from his horse the previous month while at Mount Shannon. His heir, another John Fitzgibbon, the second Earl of Clare, was not yet ten when his father died, and so the estate was looked after by guardians while he attended Harrow School in England. Here he met the young Lord Byron, who was a few years older, and who immediately became smitten with the young Irish peer. In 1807, Byron wrote a 17-verse poem to Lord Clare, the first of which runs, 
Friend of my youth, when young we roved like striplings, mutually beloved with friendship's purest glow. The bliss which winged those rosy hours was such as pleasure, seldom showers on mortals here below. The two men remained as friends, even when adults. And Byron, much later, said that he could not hear the name Claire without feeling a murmur in his heart. Eventually graduating from Christchurch, Oxford, the second Earl returned to Mount Shen, where he undertook further work on the property he'd inherited, not least by commissioning architect Lewis Wyatt to design an immense ionic portico for the front of the house. Mount Shannon was a rather severe neoclassical building, but the plainness of the Nine Bay Garden elevation was relieved by a large semicircular conservatory opening onto a terrace. In the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, Lord Clare also travelled extensively in Europe, acquiring pictures and statuary for his home, which had already benefited from his father's penchant for fine Louis XIV furniture and Sèvres porcelain. As a result, by the early 1820s, Mount Shannon looked better than it ever had before, or ever would again. And in the second episode, I'll tell you how, within a few decades, it had been hit by an irrevocable decline. Thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you then. Goodbye.